All right. Well, thanks for coming back to the uh, Bigfoot Society podcast. I have the privilege of having Richard Freeman on the podcast um, and uh, all the way f- over from uh, across across the Atlantic. Uh, it's very cool. So right now I'm, uh, I'm doing this uh, just after lunch and he is doing this uh, right before bed almost maybe uh, about few hours ahead of time. So thanks for working with your schedule on this, uh, Richard, but I'm going to go ahead and I am going to read uh, the the bio. uh, And just so you listeners have a, uh, you know what you're in for, because this is, this is going to be a crazy one. So here we go. Richard Freeman is a full-time cryptozoologist. He searches for and writes about unknown animals. The melodramatic may call him a monster hunter. He's hunted for creatures such as the Yeti, uh, the Mongolian death worm, the giant anaconda, the Ninkinaka, the Almasti, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing these, <laughs> my bad, uh, the Orang Pendek, the Naga, the Gull, uh, the Tasmanian wolf. He's the zoological director at the Center of Fortean Zoology, uh, which is the world's only full time mystery animal research organization based in North Devon. Um, a former zookeeper, Richard has worked with over 400 species from spiders to elephants, but lists crocodiles as his favorites. He's lectured at the National uh, Natural History Museum in London and the Grant Museum of Zoology. Richard is also a regular con- contributor to the magazine 14 Times. Uh, he's written books about cryptozoology, folklore, and monsters, including dragons, more than a myth, explore dragons, the great Yaki Encyclopedia, Apologies, uh, and A to Z of Japanese monsters in Rang Pendek, Sumatra's Forgotten Ape. However, he's recently branched out into horror and weird fantasy with Green Unpleasant Land, 18 Tales of British Horror. And here we go. Hayaka Monica, he's laughing at me. You guys see the video. I'm going to have you say the word because it's going to just destroy me, but it's Tales of Japanese Horror, book one. Uh, his latest work is an overview of cryptozoology and a chronicle of his own expeditions entitled Adventures in Cryptozoology. Uh, Richard's also a massive fan of classic Doctor Who, 60s and 70s, and a lover of weird fiction horror. Whew, that is the craziest bio, Richard, man. Um, ah, wow. Can you, before we get into it, say that word for me, the Japanese horror book one. That's intense. Hayaku Monogatare. It wow. means 100 stories. <clears throat> and the other oh, one man. was the Great Yokai Encyclopedia and A to Z of Japanese monsters. Yokai oh, cool. is basically monsters and ghosts in Japan. Dude, that is so cool. And we will have to, uh, the plan is to chat a, a bit about that, uh, definitely about your work uh, in the book range uh, later on the video, uh, the uh, interview. But I want to start out with like, what inspired you to become a cryptozoologist? It's always interesting to know what led the person down the path to looking for these animals. I can answer that in three words for you. Okay. Classic Doctor Who. Classic Doctor Who. Now, whoa. (laughs) Doctor Who started way back in 1963. It's the longest running, most successful science fiction franchise ever. It started in 1963. Uh, I grew up watching it in the 70s with John Pertwee and Tom Baker in the role. Mm. And I'm talking about classic Doctor Who, real Doctor Who. Uh, I'm talking about the real Doctor Who, which was as much about horror as it was about science fiction. Okay. It was very dark and very frightening in a way that shows like Star Trek never were. Oh. And one, one of the reasons was because <clears throat> when John Pertwee was at the helm in the early 70s, uh, the storyline was that the Time Lords had incarcerated the Doctor on Earth. He couldn't mm-hmm. uh, use the dematerialization code for the TARDIS. And basically, the BBC wanted to save a bit of money, so they didn't want to make alien sets and stuff. They just wanted to film it all on, on Earth to save a bit of cash. But it worked oh. out quite well because <clears throat> these monsters, these horrors, these sort of Lovecraftian nightmares were on your doorstep. They went on some alien planet. So you had storylines about uh, giant venomous green maggots crawling out of slag heaps in Wales. Um, intelligent uh, marine dinosaurs that had oh, ruled awesome. the world before uh, uh, the mammals had taken over and they'd gone into hibernation and now woken up again and seen, seen this upstart ape has overrun the planet so they start wiping them out. Uh, 
great stories about um, the these tentacled um, monstrous aliens called called the, the Nestines that project themselves mentally across space and uh, animate anything plastic. So dummies in shops come to life and smash through windows and attack people and children's toys strangle you. And you've got other ones set in Victorian London where there's a sort of a, a mad criminal from the future posing as a <clears throat> as a Chinese god and he's got all these opium addicted uh, cultists worshipping him and he's bred giant rats in the sewers wow. gnawing people's legs off and he's kidnapping prostitutes and draining the life force from them to <laughs> to take it to his own cell. Stuff that the BBC hasn't got the bollocks to do now, basically. Well, I was going to say, I was like, man, if they put half the stuff you just said on the uh, air today, that would be a different story. But, I mean, that's a different conversation for a different podcast, probably. But um, as an American, so I know there's plenty of Americans that are into Doctor Who. I could, I will say personally, like, it freaks me out how much Doctor Who like history there is. I'm like, where do I start? Because I know it's a great story and it all clicks together. But I'm like, I don't know. Do I need to go back all the way to like 1960s and start watching there? Not necessarily. Or, like, I would yeah. go. I would go with the 70s, John Pertwee and Tom Baker. That's okay. when it was at its peak. Okay. And you can dip in any time and get a great adventure. Man, oh, that's cool. I'll I'll have to seriously. I mean, we we all got a little extra time now, you know with the uh the pandemic going on so maybe i'll have to check out some of the tom baker episodes and we'll we'll see i mean i'm very intrigued uh because of how it influenced you so that's cool in itself um so that was what I, got me into monsters and weird creatures yeah 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 um, at the same time i was watching david attenborough on things like oh, life on yeah. earth and the world about us that fascinated me uh because i've always been fascinated with animals and david attenborough is one of my great heroes when i left school uh, I went straight out of school. My first job as a zookeeper, and mm. I uh, I went as a trainee and worked with a bit of everything. And then I specialised in reptiles and ended up running the reptile house. Wow! And uh, I worked at the zoo for a while, and uh, I've worked at animal sanctuaries. Uh, I left the zoo because I didn't like uh, the people that ran it and mm. very okay. poor ethics. Um, gotcha. Not only were they <clears throat> incredibly incompetent, they were deeply unpleasant human beings as well. So mm. I could have forgiven the incom sure. incompetence if they were nice people. And I could have forgiven uh, them being horrible if they were competent. But the, the mixture of both, no. no. Mm. But uh, from, I've been a grave digger. Um, oh, wow. I've done all these gothic jobs. Uh, I've worked <laughs> at animal sanctuaries. And then, and then one time I was hunting the beast of Bodmin Moor, which was one of the British big cats, these... Ooh, large cool. exotic cats that we get in various places. Uh, I was out killing sheep on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, which is in the southwest of England. And um, I happened across this place called the Jamaica Inn, which is this old haunted pub out okay. on the moors. And they had, they used to have this. They don't have it anymore, sadly. They had Walter um, Walter Potter's Museum of Curiosities attached to it. And Walter mm. Potter was this Victorian guy who did strange taxidermy. So he would have taxidermy kittens getting married, or taxidermy frogs playing cricket, <laughs> and, um, taxidermy uh, squirrels drinking in a pub and playing cards. Oh, like jackalope weird, stuff, yeah. Yeah, and he also collected yeah, yeah. weird things. So, like, you'd see the preserved head of a man-eating crocodile from India next to oh. so, a Maori axe, next to a little model of a church made out of bird feathers. All these weird, oh, heterogeneous weird. Thing. And sadly, yeah. the museum doesn't exist anymore. But in the little shop attached to the museum, there was a magazine called Animals and Men, which wasn't as rude as it sounded. Um, it was a magazine about cryptozoology. And I just picked mm. up this issue, paid for it, read it, thought it was really good. So I subscribed to it. Okay. And then I, I started writing articles for it and ringing up the editor and having the long conversations about cryptozoology with him. And he said, but when you finish at university, Mm -hmm. Come on down to uh, the Centre for Fossil and Zoology and be our zoological director. So I took him wow. upon the offer, and I moved from Yorkshire in the northeast of England down to the southwest, down to Devon, okay. and joined the Centre for Fossil and Zoology as their zoological director. And from then on, uh, the rest is history. I've been on every continent except Antarctica, 
think oh he's man a teacher and writing books about it lecturing about it that is so cool so there's an like this is an actual place like if you're over like you can visit or like you can say okay there it is like it's an actual building yeah it's a uh, a large former farmhouse in a little village okay. in the north of devon i mean it's not open to the public but it's where okay, sure, yeah, our yeah. base is we've got a library there it's where the, the magazine has been from it's where we plot our expeditions i mean oh, people man. can visit you know if they if they contact john downs the director and you know ask if they can come around to visit uh, and they, they arrange a date well, they can but you know people, people can't just wander in like it's a museum or something like that is so cool so it's like one of those um uh sorry so i'm gonna apologize if i use stuff that is like um unintentionally offensive to the uk culture because you know but um so i'm like thinking like the old school like explorers clubs that you you remember reading about like in england and like it's very like you, no one can just go in there and like it, it sounds really cool you have to know the right guy to or uh you know, to go in there and check it out. I like yeah, that. but John actually lives there. It's his house as well. John oh, Bannon. okay. It's okay, his cool. house as well. So he lives there. Cool, cool. So nice. It's, uh, it's terribly messy. There's books <laughs> and all sorts of stuff everywhere. And various animals wandering around. Because oh, we've got man. a small collection of exotic animals. So. I can't imagine the books that are in that center. It's got to be intense the resources that are just hanging out but that's cool um maybe someday i'll i'll get yeah, that would be cool to kind of look at uh, cryptozoology from the viewpoint of the uk which actually leads me into a qu another question i have um is there a difference you feel from how we view cryptozoology here in the states versus how the united kingdom views it there seems to be in in the u.s not everybody, but a certain amount of people seem to include some spurious things in it that aren't mm. really cryptids at all, like the Slender Man, which is a complete, uh, uh, it's completely made up. It was made exactly, up. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it is. Yeah. Competition for a competition yep. to make up a scary story. Exactly. Um, it's like saying Freddy Krueger's real. <laughs> but right. Yeah, a, totally. A totally. Cryptid. Yeah. And, and things like, uh, and you get all of the, the, these things off the internet that have no reality, which made like the rake and things like that, that are mm. not part of cryptozoology at all. Cryptozoology, in its cryptic sense, is unknown animals, animals we think uh, uh, are classified as extinct but might be still around, like the Tasmanian wolf, which is almost certainly still around, uh, creatures that are unknown to science, like um, the Mongolian death worm or sea serpent, and uh, also animals of a known species that have grown much bigger than the textbooks say they should like giant crocodiles giant anacondas and so forth mm. very interesting very interesting do you uh this is a question from um uh cryptic catcher on instagram um she says uh, cryptozoology is often referred to as a pseudoscience but do you consider the search for cryptids to be a scientific endeavor and if so how it's a scientific endeavor and mm. it should always be treated as such okay. um, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of there's a lunatic fringe in cryptozoology and i can understand why mainstream scientists are, are reticent about the fact that they're involved in it because of some of the things i've just I've just mentioned but you've got to remember that large animals are being discovered all, all the time a few years ago yep. a new species of tapir was found in south america and his species of manatee in South America was a large monkey found a couple of years ago. And bigger still, the, the Tapanuli orangutan in Sumatra, mm. a, a whole new species of orangutan was discovered just a couple of years ago. Wow. Uh, the Cross River gorilla, a whole new species of gorilla was found just a few years ago. And you've also got to remember things like the known species of gorilla and the Komodo dragon and the Okapi and the giant squid, they were all considered monsters from folklore once. The, mm. the natives talked about the hairy giant from the mountains that would carry off native girls and tear branches off trees and fight with elephants. Of course, it wow. couldn't do those things, but it, it exists. That's yeah, called that's... the mythalization pro process. Um, oh, okay. Sometimes fantastical 
uh, attributes or behavior are, are um, given to known animals. Mm. And it makes them sound fantastical and hard to believe, but the animal itself actually exists. For example, um, in Pakistan, uh, there's a type of gecko that local people call um, the bis cobra. And they say yeah. it has the killing power of 20 cobras. But it's not. It's a, it's a gecko. It can give you a nip, but it's not in the least bit um, <laughs> venomous. In, right. um, in Somalia, uh, there's a snake called the apris, and they believe it's so deadly that it doesn't even have to bite you to kill you. If you just touch it, the venom will seep out of its skin and kill you. A, bit, a little bit like the, the salamander in um, medieval Europe. In fact, the, the snake they're talking about is the sand boa, which is about two feet long and completely harmless to anything except a mouse. It's oh, not wow. venomous. It's a constrictor that feeds on small rodents. But these stories um, build up a, 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 around certain animals. But the animal itself exists, uh, despite the strange claims. But you can turn that on its head because there are other things as well that <clears throat> uh, have fantastical attributes that turn out to be real. There's a type of shrew from the Congo called the hero shrew. Okay. And the natives said it was so strong that a grown man could stand on its back and it wouldn't harm it. <laughs> and they take the pelt of this shrew and put it on their belts because they believe it gives them strength. Oh. Now, when they actually studied the hero shrew, they found this story was true. And its back is braced by a sort of network of bone, almost like a basket work of bone that makes its spine incredibly strong. Nobody knows why it's got it. Wow. A bird called the Pitahui from uh, New Guinea, the natives said was venomous. It was a venomous bird, which is completely unknown. And when they studied it, they, they found it does have venom it, it, on it. It's got, it secretes a sort of venom onto its uh, feathers and onto its claws and beak that can cause a rash if it pecks at you or scratches you. The giant monkey tree frog in South America that the natives said <coughs> its secretions turn you invisible in the jungle and they negate um, thirst and hunger. When biochemists looked at the secretions of this amphibian, they found it did indeed negate feelings of hunger and thirst, and it also masked human smell almost entirely, which would in effect make you invisible in the jungle. My goodness, that just, my mind just got blown those last few minutes. Like those are all things that I have never heard of. And like, it's crazy the stuff that is just hiding out in this world if we just go out there and start looking for it i love that that's like that is so cool um i, I want to take a little sidestep um and talk about i'm just curious what is your what are your favorite like uh weird uh fiction or um yeah, we'll start with that. What is your favorite uh, weird fiction books? Do you have any that, that come to mind? Oh, yes. Uh, the Ghost Stories of M.R. James, mm. Montague Road James, who was the most terrifying writer mm. uh, ever. Um, he makes Stephen King look like the Care Bears. Oh, yikes. <laughs> and he does it with such minimalism and such elegance. He was a... Um, uh, he, he was at Eton and then Cambridge. He was the, um, the provost of, of Cambridge. And oh, his, wow. his field was medieval studies, and he translated many old medieval texts and things. But as a sideline, as, as an entertainment, he wrote these ghost stories, which were about upper-class academic English gentlemen in the late 19th and early 20th century who stumble mm. onto things that they should be better left alone. And generally uh, come to a sticky end. Um, his ghosts are not so much ghosts as entities, bizarre elemental creatures. There's, there's one of his most effective stories is called A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad. And it's set on the coast of Suffolk in the east of England. And it's about <clears throat> a professor who goes on a golfing holiday and he's walking along the cliffs one day and uh, part of the cliff is eroded away and he finds an ancient whistle. And it's got a mm. Latin inscription in it, which he translates as, who is this who is coming? And he blows it. And later he has this weird sensation of being followed. And he looks back along the beach into the distance in, in the twilight. 
and he seems to see a figure that's gradually getting closer and closer to him but he thinks nothing of it and then he's haunted by various nightmares and in the end it's, it turns out he's summoning up this elemental creature and it's oh. a twist on the old bedsheet ghost and he sees okay <laughs> the bedsheets in this spare bed in his room sort of rise up and form themselves into this intensely hideous figure with this horrid face of crumpled linen that comes flapping about blindly groping for him in, in, in the moonlight um, and he, he writes these wonderfully scary things about these these horrible creatures and strange entities he, he's probably my favorite um that is awesome man i'm i'm gonna have to look that up although i it's not really my thing, but like if someone brings up something interesting, I'll, I'll check it out a little bit. So I'll, I'll give the, the story a read, definitely. I am curious about uh, your zookeeper days. Uh, why is the crocodile your favorite animal? It always has been ever since I was a child. I love it. It's oh, the okay. largest, largest known reptile uh, around at the minute. And I, I, I've always loved reptiles. I've always had a thing for reptiles. Crocodiles are utterly magnificent predators. They are big. Crocodile can bring down a, a tiger or a lion, a wolf, a buffalo, a giraffe, oh, yeah. uh, sharks even. They take down sharks. Uh, and there are rare cases when they kill rhinos and hippos. Wow. So they're absolutely um, stunningly powerful. And uh, to think that they come from such a small egg and that the youngster is, is, is a tiny little thing. Uh, everything about them fascinates me. Their behavior. They're, they're, they're more intelligent than people think as well because they exhibit very clever behavior some crocodiles will balance branches on their snouts whilst they're underwater wait for a bird to land on the, the branch and then grab the bird which is tall used and yeah. they will kill a fish and instead of eating the fish they'll use that fish as bait for larger animals again tool use and wow. they've been known to actually make living dams with their bodies climb on top of one of each other each other because outside of the mating season they're quite surprisingly social and okay. use this to corral fish and other animals <laughs> and when, when they're feeding on a big carcass it's not a feeding frenzy they'll take turns some of them will brace the carcass some of them will come in and grab it and spin around and rip bits off and they'll all take turns so we've got very complex behavior with uh, the crocodilian would you say that's the most dangerous animal you ever had um you, you ever had to take care of when you're a zookeeper or is there uh, a more uh, dangerous creature that comes to mind uh, well there's dang there's different types of danger uh, uh, okay. uh, crocodiles uh, certain types of crocodiles are man eaters and they're highly dangerous but if you know what you're doing you cannot predict what they'll do mm. and a crocodile will attack you if it feels threatened or perceives you as some sort of threat or if it, if it perceives you as prey but something like a chimpanzee will attack you out of pure spite, pure oh, hatred. Yeah. People have a false notion of chimpanzees as, as jolly little playful characters. An adult chimpanzee is no, six times as strong as a man with yeah. teeth like knives. And unlike gorillas, who have massive strength but are very placid and laid back, chimpanzees are brutally vicious, wantonly mm -hmm. vicious. And um, when they're attacking you, if they're attacking a man, the first thing they'll try and do is tear his balls off. Oh my goodness! Are you kidding me? No. Wow. They'll go straight for the genitals. Genitals oh, wow. in the face. Oh man. There's a, there's a famous case of a guy and his wife <coughs> who got a, a, a young chimpanzee they called Mojo, and they raised him as their son. And he was quite a, a local celebrity around the town that he lived in. And he never attacked anybody. But one day, a, a workman left a tool in the house. He hurt himself on the tool and then bit the workman. So from then on, they had to put him in a big cage. And um, when the law changed again, they had to surrender him to an animal sanctuary. So he went to live with some other chimpanzees at an animal sanctuary. And they'd come and visit him every day because they, they looked on him as their son. And one day, it was his birthday, and they brought him a big birthday cake. So all the chimpanzees saw this, got jealous, and broke out. They attacked this guy who owned Mojo. Mojo himself didn't attack him. The other chimps did. Okay. They 
bit off his lips, nose, ears, eyelids, what? fingers and toes, and, and ripped his knackers off. Oh my god. He survived. <laughs> and I'm not what sure I want this? to. Sorry? What year is what, this? This was about about ten years ago. Oh if my put, word. <laughs> if you type into a search engine. Okay. Okay, I'll have to check Mojo it out. Later. Chimp. And then there's another one called Travis around about the same time that had lived with a woman and also became a quite a local celebrity had never harmed anyone before but she was giving him <coughs> some kind of human drugs which mm. may have uh, and it, they, these drugs have been um, these tablets kind of what the tablets were now but they have been known to create um, hallucinations in humans she had given him some of these to keep him calm when her friend came around he just turned on her friend and ate her face Whoa. The police turned up. They had to empty their guns into him to stop him. And oh he, my he, he tore, I think he tore, actually tore the door off the police car. And it took up, you know, a whole round of bullets from him. He tore the door off the car? Yeah. And then what? He, he, he got shot God knows how many times before he finally Damn. wandered off and died. And he didn't die immediately. He went back into his cage and then died. So, oh man, those are intense. So how did, how do you feel, uh, do you feel that being a, a zookeeper prepared you for becoming a cryptozoologist in any way? Yes, it gave me um, a lot of experience on how animal behavior and how animals think, how animals act. Mm. And I, I would almost say, uh, man, because I had no idea of the the uh, intenseness of chimpanzees, but if I had that knowledge in me as I'm going out on these expeditions around the world, I'm gonna probably view that a lot different. You know, uh, finding these animals or looking for them, like I might be a little bit more cautious or aware of my surroundings, I guess. But but gorillas and orangutans are totally different, and pygmy chimpanzees uh, are different as well. Okay. Well, the, the, none of them are anything like as aggressive as, as chimpanzees. Mm, interesting. I'm curious about, um, can you go a little bit more into detail about what you, uh, like what, it, uh, what are your responsibilities as a zoological director for the CFZ? Well, I um, would oversee the animals. <clears throat> um, I don't do daily looking after the animals because I don't live at the uh, at the centre. I, I live separately. But uh, if they're setting up an animal uh, enclosure, so I'll often come and help and give advice to the people that are looking after the animals. But my main job is I'm the one that goes out into the field, doing the research, looking for the looking for the cryptids and going up mountains and through jungles and swamps and across deserts and boots on the ground. That's, that's my role. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I am curious about, so first, uh, what's your viewpoint on, uh, how do you view Bigfoot and cryptids that are, are similar? You know, in the U S our big cryptids seem to be Right now, Bigfoot and Mothman, those are the ones that usually get brought up for us. But what, what are your viewpoints on, uh, on Bigfoot and similar cryptids? Well, you, you can't view Bigfoot in isolation. It's part of a worldwide pheno phenomenon. Uh, okay. There are creatures identical to this um, reported in many places in the world. I would be far, far more surprised if Bigfoot doesn't exist than mm. it does because there are lots of lots of flags saying you know this is a real creature if you look at all the um sightings you plot say you plot height on a sighting you get what is called a bell curve you can yes. draw a graph um it sort of goes like you know a bell shape and mm -hmm. that shows that there is a in, in very basic terms it shows that there's a um population of animals of different sizes which is exactly what you'd expect to be adult adolescent ones young ones and people are seeing ones of different sizes often together um that shows that this 
seems to be a real animal. If if it was something totally fictitious, they'd all be about the same size. But it's not. That's just one of the many reasons we think that, that Sasquatch is real. And the Patterson Gimlin film, let's take mm -hmm. a look at that. <clears throat> First of all, uh, it's a female. It has large pendulous breasts. Yeah. Some people have said, some skeptics have said, oh, well, Patterson has, has, has um, read there was a famous sighting of a female Sasquatch. I think it was at Ruby Creek. I can't remember. But it was a famous of a large breasted female Sasquatch that came and had a look at a campfire on a scene. Mm. scene. And he said he must. Uh, the skeptics say, oh, he must have seen that and built his Sasquatch after this female one. But it's going to make the actual building of the costume much more expensive. Now, mm -hmm. all the known species of apes, the females are fairly flat-chested. They don't have the large pendulous breasts that oh, women interesting. Have. Okay. Uh, one of the, the reasons that women have large breasts is to counterbalance the buttock muscles. Because if you walk erect, you need big gluteus maximus muscles to work your legs. And women have larger buttocks because they have broader thighs because of the birth passage. They have wider, wider pelvic girdle. Okay. And the breasts counterbalance this. So would Gimlin and, and Patterson have known all this anatomy about sure. Yeah. Another thing, if you look at it sideways, if you look at the head sideways, you've got the forehead, well, mm -hmm. the, the, the brow ridge, you know, the forehead slopes off acutely backwards. It doesn't have a uh, an upright forehead like humans have. And most apes and hominins have this sloping forehead, even Neanderthals have it. Um, so if you were going to get a tall person and dress them in a monkey suit, right. You'd have to, if you're going to have this sloping forehead, the the fake head you're going to put on it would have to be outsized, like a sort of Mardi Gras carnival head, and it would look too big because you couldn't fit a human head into that outline unless it was a very weird and deformed human. With a, with exactly. You can see the muscles moving on it. The oh arm, yeah, no, that's my favorite part. Yeah, is you can see the leg muscles rippling in certain versions of the face. video. Show me a fake where they've put a tall person in a gorilla suit. Yeah. And it looks as good. Show me it because you can't do it. Totally, and, totally. Uh, yeah. The arms, the arms, uh, human, uh, human arms, uh, sorry, human legs are 25% longer than human arms. Mm. But the Patterson film, uh, its, it's, leg, it's legs are only 5% longer than its arms. It's got much longer arms. Now, if this was a guy in a suit and was wearing arm extensions to make it the arms look longer that would mean the fore part of the arm would look too long the elbow would be in the wrong place because these extensions would extend the front part of the arm the low part of the arm to an unnatural level and the mm. elbow would look all wrong but it doesn't it looks perfectly fine so if that's a human being it's a human being that's about seven foot tall with a sloping forehead an incredibly long arm and huge muscle structure. Man, that's that's an awesome, uh, that's an awesome flyover of the Patterson uh, Gimlin film. That was that was really cool. Thank you. I would want to get into, and I know this is going to be, this could be can of worm city, um, but can you take me through uh, maybe an overview of the the expeditions you've been on over the years? And it it looks like you've been through a lot of you know crazy adventures. Oh, good lord! Where to start? Um, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I can I can call out certain cryptids if you want. Like I I, I feel like you have that many. I've, I've I've been on the track of so many different things in so many different areas, and so that's uh. People in the past have accused me of, of only doing this because I want expensive foreign holidays. And it's the sort of expensive foreign holidays where I get co covered in leeches, covered in ticks, right. swept away by rapids, stalked by a tiger, attacked by a cobra, oh. uh, nearly fallen off a cliff, fallen down wow. an ice crevasse. <laughs> these, are, these are great holidays. People, yeah, right. Sign me up, man. <laughs> 
probably the most brutal was Guyana in South America. I went to okay. look for the giant anaconda in South America. And it's one of the very few times we got sponsorship. We got sponsorship from Capcom, the game company. So they wanted to what? Go and... Yes. No way. Why? They were releasing a new Monster Hunter game. Oh, no way. That is so cool. Yes, and totally. So it was Monster Hunter Freedom, as I, I remember. I don't play video games myself. But, but they stumped up some cash for us to go look for the giant anaconda. But we had to go in October because that's when they were releasing the game. Right. And uh, when we got to Guyana, it was in the middle of the worst drought in living memory. Oh, man. And the heat was brutal. And the place we were wasn't in the rainforest. It was out on a savanna. So it was incredibly hot with no shade. And we all suffered from um, uh, sunstroke. Ooh. It was it was a nightmare. Um, you could stagger for a, a couple of hundred yards and you'd collapse. Uh, we were torn apart by these flies called vine flies, these biting yeah. flies, covered in, in bites. And I remember my, my then girlfriend took a photograph of my ass, which had been bitten by these flies. Oh these no. Flies, and it looked like a giant, a giant mutated albino strawberry that had been grown somewhere like five mile oh. island or something. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> But that was the that was the most punishing and the most brutal because of the unrelenting heat, and it was mm. so bad we couldn't get out to the remote lakes where the giant anacondas were supposed to have been seen. Ah. And because the water was so low in the rivers, um, the helicopter we were supposed to be getting wasn't available. So everything that could go wrong on that expedition did go wrong. Oh my goodness. Um. So did you have to like make a video for Capcom or like what what was the trade off there? They were just like, hey, have fun, like here's some money or yeah, well, we wore some we wore some um, t shirts and we you know we, oh, we said okay. in, in our, when we made the the film which is up on YouTube it's called the Savage Land um, oh. and so we were sponsored very kindly by Capcom but usually the, the the money comes from our own pockets when we do things gotcha. That's awesome. Uh, that actually ties into a question I wanted to ask later, but like, so when you do these expeditions, are you um, creating films off of them? Um, or is it sometimes where it's like, you're just going so that it can be documented in the, in the center? Mainly, mainly so it's, it's fact finding, it's documenting. Awesome. You know, ideally, we want to try and prove these creatures exist, so we try and get samples and bring them back. We've got... Yeah. Um, some colleagues at the University of Copenhagen that do our DNA analysis for us and our hair analysis. We used to work with the late um, Professor Brian Sykes, the uh, geneticist from Oxford University, taking uh, an interest in cryptids, but sadly he passed away from cancer. But um, that's, our, that's our main uh, modus operandi. That's, our, that's what we go for, trying to get information and evidence. We do make films, which are sometimes put up on uh, on YouTube, where we film interviews and things and, and document stuff. But okay. Not all of our expeditions are, are put up on YouTube, but some of them are. That is that's awesome. Uh, what was it like looking for the Tasmanian wolf? What was that like? Tasmanian wolf, fantastic. Of all the cryptids, I think the Tasmanian wolf is the one most likely to exist. Sure, and we know it did that, exist. Yep. It was a, a flesh eating marsupial <clears throat> that was a fantastic example of convergent evolution. That's where two unrelated species, often on separate sides of the planet, evolved to resemble each other because they're filling the same ecological niche. They're doing similar things. And this marsupial had evolved to look like a wolf or a dog, but with tiger like stripes down the back. Now, it's supposed to have been hunted into extinction in the 1930s, but since then, there have been over 400 sightings of this, including, including one by a zoologist called Hans Nardi. And it's mm. been called the, the most uh, healthy extinct animal we've ever met. I've been over there three times now, spoke to witnesses, including a government licensed shooter who goes out keeping the feral cats down. He's seen it twice. Wow. Um, I talked to a park ranger who heard its very distinctive call, got a very distinctive um, yap in, in three 
high pitch barks. Really? Uh, also, the one guy who ran an arboretum, and he, he and his wife had seen one from a car running along the side of the road, and there were other cars that stopped. It was a mass, mass witness sighting of this, this creature. And then none of these people have got an axe to grind, and a lot of them will only tell you about their sighting if you agree to keep the area that you're seen in secret because they're worried about people going there uh we met i met an old guy who had seen one back in the 50s and his son had seen one just the year before prior to we were there and he set up a camera trap and he got film of what appears to be a large dog-like animal with striped hind quarters Mm. sitting sort of sitting near a tree and getting up and wandering off it looks to me like a, a Tasmanian wolf. He showed it crazy, to me, like a Tasmanian wolf. And the good thing about Tasmania is it's a civilized country. So, you know, you can go to a little village, stop in a hotel. I mean, it, it's not the Hilton or anything, but you can stop. You can get a roof over your head and a decent meal, and you can go out any time, day or night, looking for the creature. Wow, that's and cool. I have camped out as well. I've camped out in the bush in. Tasmania many times, um, but as I say, if you want to, you could you can always go out on a bush and into a hotel at night. <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah, you, best of both worlds, right? Um, what was it like going after the Yeti? That had to be some intense expedition work. I would yes. Imagine. Well, we searched for the Yeti in northern India. Uh, in a place called the Garrow Hills in the state of Meghalaya, which is close to Assam. And the sightings of the Yeti go all the way up from Meghalaya through Assam uh, into Bhutan and the rest of the Himalayas. And uh, <clears throat> we went into the, the mountain jungle there uh, and spoke to witnesses in some very remote uh, hill tribes, very remote villages. And they all described to a man the same creature. They said it looked like either an upright gorilla or a colossal man covered with black hair. The Yeti isn't white. The Yeti okay. is black, dark brown, gingery colored. But there are maybe two sightings I know of that's, that talk about white Yeti. You do get much more uh, accounts of white Sasquatch in North America. But the Yeti. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. generally dark fur, and they were all describing this thing about three meters, ten feet tall, very like an upright gorilla. Wow. And they were very scared of it, they said it, it, it when a lot of people, when they saw it, it would make a sort of threat um, mm. display. It would shake the bushes and roar, which sounds like a gorilla when gorillas make threat displays. They very rarely physically attack people, gorillas. They will, they will charge up and down and shake bushes and beat their chests. But they, they very rarely, unlike chimpanzees, they very, very rarely attack people. Um, okay. One guy said he, he didn't believe these stories. And then one day he saw a female one with its back to him in a, a standard bamboo. And it was breaking down the bamboo and eating it while suckling a youngster. And he said even in a sitting position it was five feet tall. Mm. Another guy said he'd seen one make a nest on the floor, all the way that gorillas make nests. He said he made, made this huge nest. Um, he watched it for about an hour making this nest. He said it was black fur, massive, and about 10 feet tall. And later, when he went down to look at the nest days later, he found like the remains of fruit there. It'd be eating fruit. And they occasionally say that they're occasionally all coming and steal from plantations. But we talked to people who'd seen them, you know, from the 1940s right up to the present day. That's crazy. Can't I can't imagine running into one of those those guys over there. That would be that would be crazy. Uh, you've got you've got a few on here that are I wouldn't I would say they're maybe the more not as well known cryptids to your you know your um your lounge chair cryptozoologist that's just like you know hanging out reading stuff. Um, what was it like going after the uh, Mongolian death worm, which is from the description of burrowing reptile of the, the Gobi Desert? Is that right? Yeah. We, well, I think it's a reptile. Mm. Um, that, of all the places I've been, is, is my favorite. Uh, Mongolia, 
um, hopefully I'm getting out there again this summer, fingers crossed. Uh, yes. Circumstances uh, willing. Um, mm. Going to Mongolia is, is the nearest thing like stepping out onto an alien planet that I've ever experienced. Really? The Gobi Desert is so vast, you can drive for days and days and see no sign of another human being. Uh, mm. When you think of the desert, you think of sand, but the Gobi Desert is very different. And it's, it's different in different areas. Parts of it look like the surface of Mars, all rocky and red. Uh, other parts look like uh, a mirror. There's a place they actually call it a mirror because it, it's made of chips of mica, which are very reflective, and it looks like a mirror going off into the distance. Uh, other parts are like black, twisted rocks. There was a frozen river which the wind had sculpted ice caves out of, that was going to these ice caves uh, in this gorge. Um, other areas look like giant cat litter trays because they were made out of weird round little particles of rock, billions and billions and billions of them. Um, <clears throat> we saw mirages over there. You hear about mirages in the desert, we saw them. They, the heat haze makes these strange illusions that look like um, cities with minarets and things and towers and others others look like lakes. Uh, we were caught in sandstorms more than once, which was like oh, aggressive yeah. fog. And then um, another time we were caught in a tornado. We were at this remote oasis where uh, death worms had been reported and uh, we were parked at the top of these cliffs near this oasis and we saw a dust devil forming in the desert. And it got closer and closer and bigger and bigger. We thought it was going to go around the other side of the oasis, and suddenly it was in the camp, Whoa. and it shredded the camp to pieces. Um, I was clinging onto the side of an old ex-Soviet um, lorry that was in the oh, nice. but a minibus, and I remember yeah. looking up, like in, in the eye of the tornado, like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, and seeing one of our <laughs> 15 foot above the ground, being whipped round and round and round, hanging on to the, the shredded remains of one of our tents. And it was only for a few seconds that it annihilated the camp, completely annihilated it. And you'd come across things like old ruined temples, half covered by sand, mm. things of worship still going in, in these incredibly remote areas. Because in the Soviet period, uh, all of that was stamped on. All of that was outlaw, the, uh, okay. any kind of religion or worship, but it went on in secret. <clears throat> and most of the temples that survived were ones that were used as storage areas. But with the death worm itself, we spoke to about two dozen witnesses. And the oldest was a guy in his 90s who'd seen it back in the 1930s. And then we, we talked to one guy who'd seen it just a year before we were there. And they all described an animal shaped like a sausage or salami, mm. about the length of your arm and about as thick as your average arm. Not on a Schwarzenegger's arm, but your average arm. <laughs> right. But it's hard to tell which end is the tail and which end is the head because they both have these sort of rounded ends. Uh, okay. Scaly, generally brick red in colour. And it engenders utter panic. In the population. One really? guy said that he was tending, as a boy, he was tending his family's camels and goats, and he saw one of these things, went back and told his parents. <clears throat> and the parents immediately rounded up all their animals, packed up the gur, which is the circular uh, tents they have, and moved out of the area. A death worm sighting can throw a whole area into a panic. They believe it can spit at a corrosive yellow venom. Or saliva that acts like acid and burns oh, you. Wow. Um, nobody said they knew anybody that had been killed by one, but they, they sort of they had friend of friend stories that a, 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 a little girl had been killed by one, or someone had goaded one with a, a stick and it spat at them and killed them. <clears throat> but nobody wow. knew this firsthand. But dozens of people had, had, had seen the thing, and their their sightings were all dovetailed together very well uh, over about a thousand nice. miles okay different oases different little villages they've seen it mostly people just see it lying in the sun 
last game. It's just been hanging cool. out. Just hanging out. Okay. I said he yeah. Tried, catch and kill a mouse. He swore the mouse. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So the description sounds rather than a worm, uh, an analog worm would dry out in the desert. It sounds yep. like a boring reptile. <clears throat> and there are two good candidates. One of them are worm lizards, the Rancus banos, which are strange sausage shaped burrowing reptiles. They're not snakes and they're not lizards, but they're related to both of them. They're very poorly studied. They sound very much like the death worm. So this could be a, a large unknown worm lizard. The other one is some sort of sand boa. We know mm. there is a sand boa living in the desert called the Tartary sand boa, but that's grey and too small to be the, the death worm. But the death worm could be a larger and discovered species of sand boa. That, that's awesome. Well, <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> also, in Mongolia, we had contemporary stories of dragons. Oh, really? Strong belief in dragons in Mongolia. Um, <clears throat> we went with a company called eMongol.com, and it was run by, by a guy called um, Biamba. And his friend told me this story that his aunt had told him. His great aunt said that just after World War II in the north of Mongolia, which is mountain, they lived a tribe that lived up in, in, in the, the mountains. They said they found a dead dragon frozen in the river. Whoa. And I was expecting this to turn out to be a sturgeon. The sturgeons have scaly backs and they can grow to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eat the biggest one was ever caught one. But they, they said, no, this is a snake like thing. Uh, and it was 100 feet long. And the scales were protruding up out of the ice. And <clears throat> whatever it was, was dead in this ice, uh, the village fed off it for a whole a whole winter because it was a very hard winter and they really and then in the summer when they well in the spring rather when they the thaw came all of the remains that were washed away nobody kept any of it because they wouldn't have known yeah <clears throat> but we heard of another story about a doctor that had seen one in a well because they're intimately linked with water dragon legends worldwide are, are linked more oh yeah water. exactly yeah <clears throat> and, um the head of this sun center. A sun is like a county in Mongolia, but suns are so huge that they can be the size of small countries. Mm. And the head of this, this sun center said, um, the, a couple of years before there was a doctor, a visiting doctor, said he, he stopped at a well to a water and there was a dragon coiled up in it. And he described it as having a face like a camel or a horse. And then this long, scaly, snake like body coiled up. In the water, and they, they believe they're linked with rain as well. They've come down from the mountain tops and bring clouds and rain with. Mm. Um, have you? It, it sounds so. You've written a few books about dragons. So, have there been uh, multiple expeditions you've <coughs> gone on to look for dragon-like creatures then, or or things of the like? Um, we we looked for a dragon-like creature when we went to Mongolia. We weren't mm -hmm. aware of these contemporary dragon sightings, but we heard them along the way. And that's often the case. You'll go looking yep. for things. But when we were in South America looking for the giant anaconda, we also heard of an undiscovered race of pygmies about three feet tall that paint their faces red and go oh, naked wow. in the bush. <coughs> totally unrecorded. <coughs> mm. that's, that's just one example. But we went to um, Gambia in West Africa to search for a dragon-like creature called the Ninkinanka which the locals very much fear. Mm. And they say, once again, it's got this long snake-like body with a horse-like face, a crest on the head, wow. shining scales. Some people say it has wings like a bat and four short legs. They believe it lives in a swamp. And if you see one, you will die within five years. So the folk will go. Wow. And most of the people we talk to they hadn't seen it, but they said, like, oh, well, a, a hunter from our village saw, saw it and he died. Or uh, my uncle saw one. One guy said, just after, once again, just after World War II, um, in uh, these lakes just outside of Banjul, which have now been turned into a national park. <clears throat> but back then they were used for pumping water into, into the city of Banjul. And his grandfather was the night watchman 
and he said he saw this huge creature come up out of the lake and he said it had this horse-like head fin on it it had great long body and it was moving and swaying side to side as if it was looking for something <clears throat> and he said that the, the, the man died sometime after that and they erected big mirrors around this lake because they believed that the only thing that would drive it off would be its own reflection mm. um, another guy said that um, he, he had seen his uncle had seen one years ago uh, in a swamp and the village was so scared that everybody abandoned abandoned the village and the village was still there in the swamp abandoned because they'd seen this minky nanka which, which bodes death <clears throat> we could only find one guy that claimed to have actually seen it himself but his story was very fantastical and he said the creature he was talking about a creature of, of serpentine but the length of it was like godzilla in hundreds and hundreds Whoa. of feet and he said it was it had these shining scales and a crest on its head and it come out of this hole but he he said afterwards he, he got all these lesions over his body so he went to see an imam which is a, mm, a sort yep. of islamic holy man and he said you've seen right. a dragon haven't you you need to take this medicine to make you well but i found his story very hard to credit because of the size he attributed to this thing unless it was an exaggeration through fear but mm. we, we came to the conclusion really that <clears throat> the minkinanka was a, a demonization of a pre-islamic python cult because in the area before oh. them took over people venerated pythons Okay. Uh, the easiest thing to do when a big religion comes in, you either absorb the local religion and takes it into it, like um, Christianity absorbs other religions and, and figures from that religion become saints, mm -hmm. or they can become demons. Right. In this case, that the Python worship has become demonized into this thing called the Minkinanka. And anything that goes wrong, they, they blame it on the Minkinanka. There was a pollution event. Oh, it's a common theme, isn't it? Yeah. They, like they, with they the thought it was the, the decaying remains of the Minkinanka have done this. Uh, yep, yep. And we were shown uh, where a, um, a lorry had crashed. Mm. And I said years before, a Minkinanka had slithered across the road in front of the lorry and caused it to crash. If people oh. go missing in the swamp, the Minkinanka have got them. That's crazy. Wow. Uh, you've also looked for um, you looked for the Naga in Indochina as well. Was that a, a similar situation Very or similar in its description? It was supposed to be like a huge snake-like animal, but once again with this fin or crest on its head. When you look at uh, the medieval bestiaries and descriptions of dragons, always say they have this crest on their head, this fin or crest on their head, and. Um, now we talked to a number of people that had seen these things. Uh, the abbot of a monastery, he said one of them, they found one of them coiled up, this huge serpent coiled up in in the ruins of an old monastery, and they and they prayed for it to go away so they could repair the monastery, and it, and it the next day it had gone. Wow. Um, uh, the head of the river police on the Mekong River said he'd seen one swimming through the water. He thought it was debris at first, but it wasn't. It was this huge, immense snake. And he stood and watched it from some cliffs. The most interesting one was an old man who said he was exploring some caves and come across an underground river. And he'd seen this vast snake, um, maybe 60 feet long, three feet thick, um, uh, black, but with a green sheen to it, crawling out of the, the uh, underground river. And he said it terrified him at the time, but I thought he thought ultimately it brought him good luck. And he took us down these caves, and we were the first Westerners ever to go down these remote caves in this jungle. Oh, wow. And we went through this absolute labyrinth of cave. caves. He, he had a candle, we had torches. I mean, I, I'm too fat to do it now. I couldn't do it. This was, this was um, oh, 21 years ago, when I was a lot slimmer. Okay, and sure. We had to wriggle through spaces and crawl on all fours. And we saw all sorts of weird stalactites and stalagmites and formations that looked like coffins and Greek pillars and one that looked like a guillotine. And it was a weird, fantastical underground world with this river running through it. And it, it was a labyrinth. And if this old guy had had a heart attack down there, we'd have never got out again. 
<clears throat> they took us to show us this river where he'd seen this snake come out of, and then um, led us back out again. And we, we, we must have gone several miles to it, and the caves go on for miles and miles more. Wow. And you think, you know, why do these people have any reason to lie? He he, right. he not got anything out of it. He got nothing yep. to out of it. Oh, man, that that's the big point. It's like these people, some witnesses, they have nothing nothing to gain yeah and it also, definitely lends to credibility people, native people it's not like here in the west mm -hmm. in in a lot of these third world countries they've got to work every hour of the day sure they can meet yep they've got better things to do than make up stories about monsters totally <coughs> oh yeah um you've it sounds like you've been on multiple expeditions about uh uh, things like the, you know, the Oring Pendek, the the Gull, the Almasty, and I tried to look up pronunciations for those, and I just could not find accurate ones. So I know I'm slaughtering them. So I'm sorry for no, that. No, you but... got them all right. Okay, cool, great. But, but Oring um... Pendek, Oring Pendek means short man in in Malay, and um, it's this creature that has been imported from the Indonesian island of Sumatra for well over a hundred years since the. Uh, the time of the first Dutch colonists went over there, and, and the natives have been reporting them for years. Mm. And there were writings from people going back all to the 18th century about these creatures. Um, they're supposed to be very powerfully built and muscular, but quite short, uh, maximum of about five feet, but usually about four, right. four and a half feet. Very powerfully built, uh, long dark hair, usually said to be grey or, or black, but there are different colour morphs as well. Strikingly human looking face. Mm. Now, I've been over there five times now. I've talked to lots of different witnesses who have seen this. Not just natives, but Westerners as well, including a woman called Debbie Martha, who is now the head of the Indonesian Tiger Conservation Group. Okay. She went over there originally in the 80s uh, just as a tourist, and she heard these stories about the orangutan that thought it was a piece of local folklore. And one day <coughs> she was talking to one of her guides, and she says, What animals live in the jungle around here? And he said, Oh, well, elephants, tigers, rhinos, orangutan decks, but you don't see them very often. And she said, Orangutan deck, isn't that just a myth? And she says, No, 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 I've seen them. Uh, about a month later, she was walking through the jungle when she heard all the gibbons making a, a, a noise. And the guide said, oh, something's coming, it's disturbing the gibbons. I'll come and see if I can flush it out so you can see it, whatever it is. She was expecting to see a tiger or something. And she said, mm. what stepped into the clearing was this upright walking ape. And she said, it didn't look like an orangutan, it didn't look like a gorilla, it was something in totally different and she's seen them on four occasions since then <clears throat> and we talked to so many um, witnesses there's a guy called Jeremy Holden who's a, a wildlife photographer he saw one as well oh wow and on our trips we found footprints now I'm au okay with the footprints of all the known apes where it's just around the given this was different it had a very human looking heel four toes at the front and an offset big toe. But it looked like it was designed for weight bearing on the ground rather than trees. Also found its handprints, again, totally different from an orangutan, uh, thick sausage-like fingers and a much bigger thumb than an orangutan. Because usually it walks erect, but one time we followed the trail up a hill uh, with loose dirt on it. And you can see where the animal had fallen onto all fours and scrambled up on its uh, on its hands and feet. I've heard it calling in the forest. One of my colleagues, uh, Dave Archer, his first expedition, his first day in the jungle, he actually saw it. Him okay. and our our then guide Sahar Dimmer, who sadly passed away uh, since then, uh, both saw this creature clinging to a tree stump, and he described it as having black fur, very much like a mountain gorilla in its texture, strikingly human-looking face, mm. very powerfully built. And he said it looked very afraid. It, it knew it had been spotted and he could see fear on its face. <clears throat> and it climbed down out of this tree stump and walked away 
on two legs. And Sahar, our, our guide that lived in the jungle all his life, that was a turquoise turn. We don't know if he tracks before. We did get some hair uh, from the area, and that was sent for analysis to Copenhagen University by their he mammal hair expert, Lars. Okay. And Lars said that the scale arrangement and the pigment arrangement in it was of a higher primate, similar to, but different from an orangutan, and that he was forced to conclude that there was a large unknown primate in Sumatra. Mm, that's awesome. Oh, man. I, I want to check real quick that uh, we are okay with time. I want to be respectful for your time. Um, I'm doing nothing tonight. We can carry on as long as you want. I mean, you you got to, like, stay indoors right now, right? Like, yeah. I was talking to Dr. Charles Paxton last week and he was like, Hey, I'm not doing anything. Let's, let's party. Yeah. Oh, you know, Dr. Paxton. Yeah. We did yes, a great yes. uh, interview about sea monsters and statistics. Yes, from, it, yeah, it was cool. He's written, but. A, he's written a, uh, a, 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 what would you call it? A, um, a formula that predicts there should be about 40 of new yep, yep. Uh, marine animals. Yeah. Oh, he's such a, a smart individual. And like, it makes me want to get into reading scientific journals because it's like, that's how you get his information is in scientific articles, but he's a very cool guy. Um, do you mind? Um, I have a few, uh, a few audience questions. We definitely want to get into those. Yeah, sure. All right, cool. So first one is from Greg. Uh, he's from the Patreon. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram, all dot the dot weird. Very cool guy. But his question is, what is the closest you've ever come to having an encounter with a cryptid? Oh, now this was mm. in Russia. Oh. This was the Almasti. Ah. <clears throat> now, the Almasti is the Russian wild man, and it is distinct from the larger Yeti and Sasquatch. Mm. The, the, Yeti, the bigger type of Yeti and the Sasquatch and the Chinese Yere all appear to be the same species or subspecies of the same creature. Ah. The Almasti is slightly smaller, seven, seven and a half feet tall. Okay. Muscular, hairy, thick brow ridge, broad, flat nose, wide uh, mouth with very, very thin lips, um, very primitive, no fire. Its tool use is hurling rocks and swinging clubs. But in the Soviet Union, they took it so seriously that they had a commission to look for it, a government backed commission. Um, mm -hmm. called the Snowman Commission, um, headed up by uh, Dr. Boris Prozhnev and um, Dr. Marie Jean Kaufman, who's still alive. She's 101, I think, now. Oh, wow. Uh, Piper Smolin and all of these very august uh, uh, Russian scientists. And it's just recently been reinstated, the Snowman Commission, so they took it very seriously indeed. <coughs> we went to the Caucasus Mountains to look for the mm -hmm. And okay. we talked to a number of witnesses, including a geologist who was the deputy head of Alberus National Park, who had seen one of these things. He, he saw it at twilight. He thought he'd stumbled across uh, a cow lying down, and it stood up and he saw it was this huge, muscular, man like creature that walked oh. away up, up the hill. Um, and over there, they just take it for granted. We talked to an old couple who'd both seen these creatures. Uh, the, the old lady had seen one in Kazakhstan uh, in her youth, just after the Second World War, and the old man had seen one just a few years ago in this particular part of Russia, in the Caucasus. And the old lady said, well, why have you come over here? She couldn't understand why a bunch of scientists had come all the way from England to something that to them was no more fantastical than like whatever. there. <laughs> uh, it's like it, it, you like them coming over to England to look for badgers. Yeah, show <laughs> me the cow. Show me the cow, guys. <laughs> yeah. But we've we heard all sorts of stories. There was one one tale of one of these things that had attacked a guard dog with a club, killed the dog with a club, and broke oh. into the house and, and stole a big round of cheese. Of the cheese right? And they will approach remote farmhouses and stuff in search of food. And there's traditions of actually leaving food out for them. And this old man I just mentioned, he said he, he left food out, uh, mm -hmm. bread out for one of them, and he saw a young one. He said it was a, it was a youngster, it wasn't a full grown one. Um, 
and it's this long mane of hair on its head, browny grey fur. He didn't get a good look at the face. He said that the hand that took the bread was very human looking. Mm. Um, wow. We went with other scientists from the Ukraine and Russia. Um, Gregory Panchenko, who's one of the Ukrainian scientists, he had seen one in the barn. The, uh, the man who owned the barn said he had an old mare that he, he would leave in this barn and something would come and interfere with it at night and flat its, its mane. Now, I was very sceptical about this because horses move about at night and they Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Gregory, yep. said, Gregory said he hid in that barn and he saw a young master coming through. Well, actually, he fell asleep. And when he woke up, the window was open. Moonlight was, was pouring in, and a young almasi had come into the, the window, and he was only about ten feet away from it, hiding under all the straw, whilst it was messing around with the, the entertaining itself by messing around with the, the mane of this horse, and it was making a smacking sound with its lips like that, and then twittering like a bird. And when it was sufficiently am amused itself, it jumped up onto the rafters and ran back to, out through the window. It wasn't a glass window; it was like the window with wooden panels. And he'd left some food out of where he'd, he'd eaten all the food. Mm. Uh, another guy we were with was a, an archaeologist called Anatoly Serendenko. And he had said he'd seen one about seven feet tall, covered with long grey hair, just walking through this long grass. Uh, another guy said um, he was with some German tourists and he saw one entering this old abandoned house because they were hanging around old houses and stuff. And he said the Germans freaked out. And he wanted to go on, but they wouldn't let him. They were so scared. He said, it turned and sort of bared its teeth at him in a threat posture. And this thing Whoa. again, over seven feet tall, black hair, this one. Yeah, no. Um, to answer the question, sort of rambled a bit there, but to answer the question, mm. we staked out an old abandoned farmhouse. Not okay. the same one that Gregory had seen the Almaty, and that had been torn down years before. It was ah. a few miles outside of a town, a little village called, rather called uh, Neutrino. And um, this farmhouse, it was sort of an L-shaped building with a veranda running around it. It had been abandoned since the early 70s, but sometimes shepherds hung out there. Um, the Almasi was supposed to appear there now and again. There was one story that about eight years before, on the veranda, there was some uh, shepherds, and they were just smoking at uh, twilight, and they said the door at the end of the veranda opened when a seven-foot Almasi was there. It walked along the veranda, came up to one of the men, just moved him out of the way, carried on, jumped off the end of the veranda and, and disappeared into the, into the forest. And it was around this barn that Anatoly, the archaeologist, had seen an Almasi a few years before, the big grey Almasi. Mm. So we set up camera traps all around the farm and the outbuildings. We laid out bait of meat, fruit, red wine, honey. Mm. And uh, then we just waited. Mm. And about 10 o'clock at night, it was dark, I heard a twittering noise like a bird. And I thought, oh, well, it's not going to be a bird this time of night. And I thought, I wonder if that could be what I think it is. And one of the, the camera traps went off, there was a flash. Ooh. And nothing at all happened for hours and hours. And we went back into the inside, because we were out on the veranda, we went back inside uh, one of these rooms to warm ourselves around um, an old stove, sort of an old range they had in there. And, and one of my mates, Dave, if he's the guy that saw the orange ten there, he fell asleep on this manky old mattress. And myself and a guy called Adam Davis, you may have heard of him, he's another British yep. cryptozoologist. He lives in, I've heard um, the name, yeah. America now. Yeah. Um, he's been looking for the orange ten deck a lot. Like, like, like. And um, we were just sitting there warming ourselves in front of this this stove and um, there was a big door that led into this room and the door must have been knocking seven feet tall the door and it's slightly ajar and there was moonlight and starlight coming through and from outside we hear this deep guttural vocalization that sort of went bum, 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 bum. Whoa. Uh, it sounded like something with a big chest big broad chest making i can't uh, i can't replicate it properly and i said did you hear that and he said yeah then I was counting the seconds, but it was about 25 seconds later, something walked along the veranda. Whatever it was, was on two legs, because as it passed the door, it blotted out the moonlight and the starlight. 
the height of seven foot plus. And I said to Adam, it's out there on the veranda now. So we grabbed our camera, like ring out, but whatever it was, it was it disappeared in, into the night. So we, we did a bit of circuit of the, of the farm, but we couldn't find it. Then we checked the camera traps in the morning, and all we got was vegetation moving. So oh, was yeah. that an owl mastiff? I don't know. If it was a bear, it wouldn't have been walking on its hind legs, and it would have made more noise. If it was a man, it was a very tall man. Wow. <clears throat> so who knows? Then another time, I was in Tasmania. I'm a fellow okay. Tasmanian wolf, and I was in a remote part of the forest in eastern, uh, in sorry, western Tasmania, along a little trail. And the Tasmanian wolf was supposed to have a smell like the striped hyena. Mm. <clears throat> and um, all the old trappers who knew it in the time of its official um, official uh, existence, they said it had to smell like a hyena because many of them had been to South Africa in the Boer Wars and they knew what a hyena smells like. I know what a hyena smells like. And I got this distinct hyena like smell along this, this one narrow bit of this path as if mm. the animal had just a few minutes before crossed over the path. And it was, wow. it, and I set up a camera trap there. I came back later and the smell had gone and we got nothing on the camera trap. But was that a fire sign? I can't say. But it, it's whatever it was, it was something that had been there that smelled very like a hyena. Oh, and it's yes. interesting that there was, there was a, uh, <coughs> I think he was from Melbourne University, a guy called Professor Henry Nix, who created a computer program called BioClim. And um, what he did with that, it was a research tool to aid zoological researchers. You'd enter in all the data you knew about a certain animal and all okay. the data you knew about the environment. And it would match these two up and it would predict where in any given uh, area this animal was most likely to be found. Like if you wanted really? to look for white, white rhinos in Botswana, it would say the best area to look for white rhinos in Botswana by matching up the known habits with mm. the geographical region That's and he tried this with a, with a thylacine with a tasmanian wolf in yeah. um, tasmania and he found that there was a 98 percent matchup between where the computer program was saying they should be if they were still around and where people were reporting them to. that is cool oh man i love it um th those were man greg that was that was a fantastic uh uh, question to lead into all that that is awesome um on twitter uh so uncle monsters spooky time fright hour half the fun is saying the usernames um at uncle monster six says if you could show the world one thing what is your number one best evidence of the existence of a cryptid that you've encountered in your career that would be the hair from the orang pendek okay it's been looked at by Copenhagen, yep. an expert from Copenhagen University, and he says awesome. the the scale arrangement, the, the the pigmentation, it's a higher primate, but it's not anything known to science. Cool. And uh, some of these are probably going to be. Um, I'm I'm just going to read the question. Uh, some of them may be kind of alluded to already, but we'll go with it. So over on Instagram, at Marlon Wolf says, did he get any clear photos of any of the cryptids that he's gone after? No, okay. we never have. We've set up camera traps, we've photographed all kinds of wildlife, <clears throat> and we've found footprints, cast footprints, mm -hmm. we found hair. Oh, awesome, yep, we've yep. We've never got a photograph, not yet anyway. Yep. But what we found out is when, when we tested these camera traps in England, we say, if you put them up for a couple of weeks, you don't get mm -hmm. anything, you might get a bird or something. But uh -huh. if you leave them up for a couple of months, we got otters, badgers, foxes, deers, woodpeckers, a woman having a tea in the bushes, <laughs> And all sorts yeah. of things. So they have to be left for a long time. And the thing is, when we do these expeditions, we can only go for two or three weeks because of financial restraints. Oh, Whereas yes. ideally, yeah. you should be spending months out there. When they, they okay. first tried to get film of the snow leopard, uh, it took them something like six or seven years to film snow leopards in the oh, wild. Wow. And that's a known animal we know existed, but to get wild mm. footage, it took about six years, six or seven years back in the 60s and 70s and yeah. uh, so it just goes to show you need a lot more time so what we what we need is the group folding green stuff we need much more funding so we can 
instead of spending two weeks in an area, we can spend months and months on end. And we can put whole legions of camera traps in areas yep. that are linked to a satellite that we can download from a computer in England. And we can look at the, the photographs that way as well. That would be cool. That is a cool idea. <coughs> Hopefully that happens someday. I mean, like that would be crazy, right? You never know. Uh, the next question, um, and this one's kind of, it's an interesting question and feel free to decline if you want to. I will not be offended. Uh, it's from Bigfoot Anonymous. Uh, what's the closest to death you've been on an expedition? Has anyone fallen mysteriously? Well, yeah, wait, we're not through yet. Has anyone fallen mysteriously ill or delirious? And have you found any ancient ruins that cannot be explained by modern science? So he's like, give me the Indian, like, you ever had any you know, weird stuff happen. <laughs> yeah, well, we found ruined temples out in the Gobi Desert, but they were right. not unexplainable by science. Okay. Uh -oh. Can you hear me still? Yeah, let's let's give it a minute oh, to catch up. Like yeah, we yep. found these these temples in in the, in the Gobi Desert. But... Here we go. <laughs> I think we're back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So no one explained ruins, but explained ruins, yes. But they were okay. fascinating and rather eerie. And um, but as for uh, the nearest to death I've come, that was in Russia. Uh, there's mm. a particular mountain in, in Russia that really didn't like me. Um, okay. <clears throat> one time I was going up it, and I was walking along an area I thought was solid, and it wasn't. It was just impacted snow and I went through the snow and then I was sort of sliding down towards this great crevasse and I about a, a 500 foot drop and I just managed to ram my boots into some rocks and stop myself slipping off the edge of this, this cliff. Wow. Then the same day going back down again um, I got uh, I, I, I got separated from the rest of the group and I was walking along the edge of a a cliff that had been gouged out by a retreating glacier Ooh. fell from underneath me. I managed to grab hold of some roots like uh, Indiana Jones. Was Man, that that's like awesome. Yeah. And a few days later, still in Russia, as the, mm. Russia had it in for me. Uh, a few days later, on a different mountain, I was crossing a, uh, um, a river and it was like, like a really, really rough river. And I nearly got swept till I got swept off my feet and and uh, Gregory just managed to grab me by the, the collar of my by my jacket and pulled me out before I got swept away by the by the current. I got stalked by a tiger in Sumatra. Uh, the last time I was in Sumatra, the last night in the jungle, in in the clearing we were in by the the, the lake uh, in the caldera of an extinct volcano called okay. um, Gunungtuju. <coughs> uh, it was raining and. We were sitting in our tents and there was a fire, we had a big fire going and I was looking out to this narrow path that led up to the jungle, the one way in and out from this clearing and I got this terrible feeling of being watched. I said to the other people, there's something up there in the darkness along that mm. path, I was watching, I just know there is. There's a crawling at the back of my neck and in, in the, on the morning when we were packing up there were fresh tiger tracks and it stalked us, come down and the fire had stopped it getting, going any further. The fire had that's I got crazy. attacked by a spitting cobra in, in Gambia. It came out onto the, the jungle path and reared it and had a go at us. And then it Man. looked like it was going away again and then turned back and had another go just to <clears throat> just to uh, show us who was the boss. Jeez. I'm surprised that you like I'm surprised you're here, man. Like those are some crazy coincidence stories like you got through like wow oh man more power to you hopefully the uh um i'm sure that the the future will have amazing stories as well um atomic rancher says uh this is an interesting question what's your hypothesis on how these creatures have remained unknown to science and do you think we're talking about actual physical biological creatures uh, most of the time, yes, we're talking about okay. physical biological creatures. Okay. <clears throat> They've remained um, 
elusive because they live for the most part in very remote areas where the human mm. population is non-existent or very very low and they've survived by being elusive for instance sasquatch is mainly nocturnal so it's like a nocturnal mm -hmm. okay. to avoid competition with modern man mm -hmm. um and it's just so you look at something like the yeti a highly intelligent higher primate now if it took, took us seven years to film snow leopard mm. How long it would take to film a yeti uh, an intelligent primate maybe a hominin rather than an ape that um doesn't want to be filmed it doesn't want any contact with human beings it wants to stay away from it gotcha what do you think um you know thinking over all the expeditions you've gone is there an expedition you haven't been able to gone go on yet that would be like like it's you know I gotta get uh, going someday to go look for this one. Yeah, there are, there are two things that jump okay. to mind. <clears throat> there are a series of lakes in Siberia, Lake mm. Chani in southern Siberia, and Lake uh, Labanika and Lake Barota in eastern okay. Siberia. They all have traditions of large, aggressive aquatic creatures that have killed people. In Lake Chani, the scenario unfolds like a, a, a horror novel. Uh, this is a big lake it's 50 miles 53 miles long 50 miles wide it's not terribly deep but over the past oh 17 18 years in this lake something has killed and eaten about 19 people wow and witnesses say that it is about 30 feet long serpentine it rams boats strips boats over grabs people mm. and then drags them away and sometimes partially chewed bits of them uh, wash up. Uh, one really? woman said she saw her son, I'm sorry, sorry, her grandson, who was uh, a former soldier, fishing on a boat. And she said this animal ran the boat, flipped him into the water, grabbed him, he was never seen again. Another guy was out yeah. fishing with his friend on a boat, same scenario, the creature rams the boat, they both fall into the water, his friend is grabbed and pulled under, he makes it to the shore and they've asked the government for an official investigation and the government said oh people are just getting drunk on vodka and drowning <laughs> that chews you to bits and, and yeah yeah and these other lakes as well there's two, there's two other lakes where there's there are huge unknown animals and could, but that first lake like channing there are villages around it fishing villages. okay okay these are the lakes they're out in the middle of the, the Siberian wilderness, and the Ivenk people, the nomads, go there sometimes, and they say that they've had rafts overturned and people killed by uh, wow. these creatures, or they've seen their dogs have chased deer into the water, and this thing has come out and grabbed the deer and pulled them under. Now, there's one story from the early part of the, the 20th century of a, an Ivenk family that was staying near um, Lake Lavanika. And a seven-year-old child was snatched from the bank by this creature, and his grandfather baited it out in revenge. So the story goes: his grandfather made a bait from reindeer hide and filled it full of smouldering coals and threw it into the water. And the thing came up, grabbed a hold of the bait, swallowed it, and then it was thrashing about. In the morning, it was lying mm. dead on the uh, on the on the bank, and it, they, they said it was about. 23 feet long, it had this great long, almost beak like head. So it sounds like it might be a gigantic sturgeon. It could be a huge sturgeon, although sturgeons are generally bottom feeders. And as far as I know, there's no record of them attacking people. <clears throat> but you never know if a sturgeon gets to a certain size, it might go through anything. But of course, they, they were nomads, they didn't preserve the body. But the, apparently, this stream that runs into the, into the lake is, is now called. Um, Stream of the child after the child that was, was devoured. That's uh, the one I really want to do. Uh, also, I want to go and look for there are various stories of gigantic crocodiles in, in places around the world. Some oh, of okay. terrifying man eaters and others mm. that are sort of venerated. Um, uh, along the Sepet River in uh, New Guinea, there's supposed to be this lagoon where absolutely titanic crocodile lives. And the local people believe it protects them. They look on it 
<coughs> very favourably, they say it's never eaten anybody and it protects them. And it's probably a big male that's chasing the other crocodiles <laughs> out of the out of the wow. lake. And then there's there's in um, in Agusan Marsh in the Philippines, there's a, a, a giant crocodile, supposed to be at least 30 feet long, called Poton, which is supposed to be a man-eater. Okay. And up in northern India as well, in um, Odisha, in northern India, there's supposed to be another gigantic crocodile. And there's Gustaf from Africa, from Lake Tanganyika, who's supposed to have killed at least, thir- uh, at least 300 people. And he, he's 20, 25 feet long. So I want to go and look for all these giant crocs as well. I want to find the world's biggest crocodiles and film and photograph them. That would be so cool. And it's a great callback to your love for crocodiles from yeah. your entire life. And like, maybe that's the culmination is finding the, the world's biggest crocodile. That would be so cool. It's very, uh, it has a, a very cool theme to it. Um, as we start to um, kind of wind down a little bit, this has been like probably one of the coolest interviews I've done because we're actually getting into like the, the expeditions and everything, which is really cool. Um, I would love you to, to talk for a bit about like, you know, if people haven't read your books, like, um, you know, what are, what are things they can expect from, uh, the books that you've written? Uh, I know there's, um, and you've written books all across the board, but also like, how can people, you know, follow you if you're on different, um, have different, you know, places in the internet and the CZF, um, you know, things like that. Right, well, the website is the Centre for Fortean Zoology, which is uh, yeah, www. CFC, sorry. Yep. Yep. Uh, www.cfz.org.uk. Thank you. And that's the, I don't have my own personal website, that's the website of the Centre for Fortean. Okay. So that's the best place to, you know, uh, look at what we're doing. And it, it, we also publish books. We have a uh, publishing arm of the, the CFZ as well, <clears throat> where we publish books on cryptozoology, and we've about branched out into other areas of Fortiana and into fiction as well. So that, that's the best thing. And uh, my latest book, which is published by a company called Mango, is called uh, Adventures in Cryptozoology Volume One. It was mm-hmm. what was going to be originally a single volume, but there was too much in it, so they had to break it into two. <laughs> Second volume should be out uh, in the autumn. This year. And then the second volume is mainly about my own expedition in this area and what I've done looking for strange creatures around the world. Uh, the first volume covers dragon like creatures, sea serpents and lake monsters, uh, mysterious primates, uh, a miscellany that I call the magic zoo, which is things like basilisks and unicorns and salamanders, oh, nice. where these stories may have had their genesis. And um, and the second volume is well, mainly it'd be about my own adventures, but it'll also be about giant animals like um, giant anacondas and giant crocodiles and things. And oh, cool. Things yeah. that are supposed to be extinct, but maybe still around, like the Tasmanian wolf, the giant brown sloth, and things like that. So between them, the two volumes will cover the whole gamut. But <coughs> at the moment, uh, only the first, first one is out, uh, Adventures in Cryptozoology Volume 1, which you can get online. Anyway, that's my latest one. But I've also written Dragons More Than a Myth, which is a look at dragon legends worldwide, and Explore Dragons, which is about dragon legends mainly in the British Isles, okay. the Great Yokai Encyclopedia, which is <laughs> about monsters and ghosts in Japan. And Japan has the weirdest folklore of any country in the world. I stumbled onto this by accident and got absorbed by it, saw there was no good book in the English language about it, so I had to write it. There you go. They've got giant bipedal carnivorous rabbits that dig up corpses and eat their livers. Yikes. What, yeah, that's definitely an interesting on, culture. I, I don't yeah. know. It's, but they are endlessly bizarre. Monsters that eat people's hair. Oh, all sorts wow. of things. And then I've got, I wrote a book on the Orang Pendex called Orang Pendex Sumatra's Forgotten Age, which was about my first four <laughs> expeditions to Sumatra. And I've done a, a, a fifth one since, but it covers my first four and all the background into Orang Pendek and what it might be and all the historical sightings and other things similar to it around the world. <coughs> that is cool. That is cool. Um, and uh, just to double check, um, 
uh, I know I had, I no, uh, it, it feels like you're extremely busy. So I think I know the answer, but no, like pretty much uh, social media presence of like uh, Instagram or Twitter or anything like that. Not really. No, you okay. can follow me. That's on, fine. You can follow me on Facebook. Okay, cool. Follow me on yep, Facebook. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, oh, man, Richard, thanks so much for coming on. This has been super awesome. Um, I think everything, everyone should definitely check out uh, Adventures in Cryptozoology uh, Volume 1. Uh, and definitely, I know we're excited for the second volume to come out in the, the, the fall autumn. That's awesome. And you have agreed to stay on for a little bit longer to do some, uh, some extra uh, stories for the Patreon. So thank you for that. Um, if you want to hear that, it's just uh, patreon.com forward slash uh, Bigfoot Society and uh, $5 a month helps support the uh, podcast. So again, thanks to you so much, Richard, for coming on. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to chat again sometime it's in the future. Pleasure. I, I love yeah. talking about this stuff. I mean, oh, totally. Yeah, ideally, yeah. ideally, I'll be down the pub with several pints of cider talking about it. But Dude, I would love that. It. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that would be great. Maybe someday. Who knows? A well, cider in America. <laughs> Cider in America is just apple juice, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's totally just that. Over, well, here, yeah. over here, cider's alcohol. It's a very oh, strong yeah. alcoholic drink. Cider. We have hard cider, but it's probably way better over where you are. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Richard, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure.